Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, we are going to get started here. Um, uh, we're going to be having uh, two and a half hours here, of course. Um, uh, in the first part, uh, the lecture, and the second part uh, being uh, presentations uh, for the ID ones. Um, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to going through them in, in some detail um, with uh, marking um, and uh, talking with the teams about that. In the meantime today, I wanted to cover a number of specific items. Um, uh, it's a little bit of a grab bag of, of comments on uh, testing related topics, um, which include uh, a, lot of, a lot of discussion on um, uh, issue tracking, um, uh, bug counts. Um, probably not going to talk further right now about traceability, but uh, I will be going into some additional uh, tips um, related to uh, the the test uh, framework and uh, running uh, reproducibility of bugs, etc. Okay, as time allows. This will continue on Thursday. Um, to the, the degree it does not allow. Are people okay with this light in the front being off? Uh, it seems most of you are far enough back. You'll you'll receive the uh, the backlights as much as the front. Um, anyone have an issue with this? Anyone prefer me to turn it back on? Okay. Um, okay. So this is a grab bag of different testing related topics. Each of them fairly important, but you know um, not. Uh, not spectacularly uh, um, uh, too nuanced, but I did want to give you some of my expectations in these different areas. One of them concerns defect reports and defect tracking systems. Okay? Um, uh, as is the case this semester, and has been as has been the case for years and years in 371. Um, 371 teams make central use of defect tracking systems. And these days we've standardized around GitHub issues, uh, which is good. Um, uh, although tasks uh, are often um, uh, handed out and, and, and kept track of also in uh, Trello. And I know some of the groups this year are using, uh, using Trello. Um, uh, th there's really, you know, a uh, a, a large reliance on issue tracking, um, uh, and there can be links to reporting tools associated uh, with reporting status of bugs closed and and uh, new defects open, uh, etc. Um, I want to draw attention because I'm I'm not sure how much you use these things in 370. Um, did you use defect tracking systems in 370? Like like uh, issues or Bugzilla or Jira, Redmine, no? Okay, so um, if this is your first exposure to it, um, it's fairly self-explanatory, but I wanted to comment on a couple items here for which you are responsible. Um, for defect reports that uh, are created, typically those are created by either testers or developers. Um, Either one can create them. I expect testers will contribute a lot, uh, given their role in, in testing the, uh, the quality of the system. Um, you're going to want to have a brief title. There's this very important distinction between priority and severity. Okay? Priority um, reflects the degree to which this really needs to be fixed. Um, and it takes into account two important things. Number one, at least two important things. Number one, the probability that this will arise, and number two, the severity. Okay. Um, uh, there may be other reasons, like client, uh, a particular client perspective on this bug. Their their uh, their focus on it, uh, the degree to which it's embarrassing to them, um, that may play a role in priority too. But basically, this is about to what degree does it have to be fixed um, or fixed opportunistically, et cetera. And bugs are often triaged into lower categories here, recognizing that there might not be time to fix a defect safely um, before the next deliverable. Why would that be? Why would it be that 
you might decide that a given defect um, is safer to leave uh, in the system rather than fix. Yeah, Mesa. Okay, yeah, so, so it might have a very localized effect. So it, 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 it has problems associated with it that are very, um, they're very limited within the system. And, and by contrast, fixing it might, might screw things up throughout the system, for example. Um, so in, in short, one of the major reasons is risk. And one of the major reasons for the risk is lack of time. Okay, so sometimes after you go and fix a defect, first of all, it may take longer than you anticipate. Um, it, it may be a tricky debugging process or a tricky fix once you've found the, the underlying fault uh, in the debugging, but there may not be time to retest the full system to really evaluate is this is the system working properly across its breadth? And so if fixing it might have introduced problems elsewhere, which is very common, as we'll see, larger bug fixes about 50% of the time. 50%, half the time, they introduce new problems. Small, small fixes, like 10 lines of code or less, maybe 20 to 30% of the time, new bugs creep in. And so one of the, the issues is this is kind of the devil that we know, and if you fix it, there might be, you know, the devil we don't know that will get in there, and which we won't even know about in time for the release. So at least this one that we know about, that's in the system already as a defect, we can warn the user about, we can put in place workarounds, etc. If we put in place a fix that causes a new defect, we don't have enough time to find, observe, fix. It's hard to have the user prevented from stumbling over it. And it may be worse, right? So it's a very real phenomenon that we triage defects. And I know both teams have triage teams. And that's exactly what you'll be doing. You'll be figuring out, is this defect something that it is sufficiently safe to fix now, or do we leave it and simply acknowledge it and perhaps suggest a workaround? That's basically them. Okay? Um, now, in addition to priority, there's severity. And severity has to do with if it occurs, how deleterious or problematic is, is its result? Give me a couple that are very serious types of problems, very high severity. Mason? No. Mason? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, my location-based algorithm is, uh, is, is, is running afoul of my face-based algorithm. Um, uh, okay, um, so security flaw. Yeah. Devastating potential security issues. How about others? So Evan? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what, what, what did you say? Data loss. I data loss. Yeah, that. data loss is disastrous. It, it delivers negative value, right? They have the data, you run it, and the data is destroyed. It's like you provide an anti-value to them, right? You, you, you sucked away their, their value from, from them. That's horrible. Uh, how about other classic problems with severity? Crashes. Right? Perhaps it hangs. It just, just stops and it, it, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, these are all, you know, uh, extremely serious, uh, extremely serious levels of severity. Um, on the same time, there can be somewhere, you know, major functionality doesn't work, um, but the system isn't compromised, data isn't corrupted or lost. System's not broken into or minor functionality. Um, so, with severe.
severity, you can have something that's high severity but low priority. Give me a sense of something that would be high severity but low priority. Low priority affects, but it's 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 very severe. Not press control alt delete, right? Um, avoid the escape key or something. Yeah, you you could do that. You know, um, do not warning. Do not uh, drop keys well until you know this is uh, <coughs> information appears. Um, okay, so so that's good. Uh, how about something that's high priority but low severity? Yeah. Something that's kind of minor but really important that happens frequently in the system? Yeah, like a misspelled name of the sponsor on the splash screen, for example. Or or an incredibly ugly um, ugly uh, color scheme that, that comes up, right? Um, it doesn't destroy data. It doesn't crash the system, but it's, it's it comes up so frequently it's it's, it, you know, it just can't be lived with, right? Um, there's many other things for severity. You know, uh, a, a crash that can occur on really old hardware that um, is is little used, and therefore, once again, you could you could say our system just doesn't work on this hardware um, from now on, or such an old version of Internet Explorer that you know essentially. It, you're not going to find realistic cases of this. Or if you do, there's going to be other browsers available, et cetera. So priority and severity are different. Priority is the one that's, that's driving my like, duty fixing. Um, in addition, for defect tracking, there should be, if possible, a reproduction point. What do I mean by this? Stand by. Yeah, yeah. How do I cause this to happen? And ideally, this is something that's been refined. It's not something that that you just throw in there, you know, um, after many, many, many steps. You, you try to probe a little bit if you're a tester. How can I reproduce this really quickly? If you get into it, it's a lot of fun, actually. Like, how can I bring the system down with just a few steps in this sort of way? And often you find that. It's just a few things that are needed in the right sequence, and boom, it's brought to its knees. So reproduction formulas are really important. Why is this so important to have the ability to reproduce it quickly? Yeah, Sam? Are you trying to fix it? It's kind of hard to fix it. Yeah, debugging is, oh, debugging is um, one of those times where you really want to be able to, to reproduce it quickly so you know, you're zero, zeroing in on it, maybe because you're disabling sections of code or turning turning off areas of your code and trying to zero down into what area is um, is causing the problem. Or you're, you know, trying to catch it at different stages and you want to trace it as far as you can to its source. And uh, being able to reproduce it quickly lets you check, okay, it reaches here, it reaches here, it reaches here, and never reaches here. The problem um, is at least manifested between here and here. Um, uh, okay, the person assigned to fix it, area of the project. Um, this status is important. We're going to come back to this. Um, but basically, it has to do with um, the degree to which it is just reported but not yet active. The degree to which it's active indicates it's actually um, confirmed as an issue, a current issue. It's not merely a duplicate of another. It's not merely uh, an, an issue with an outdated version of the system. Fixed, the, the developer claims that it's fixed. Um, and and then uh, there will be successive levels we'll, we'll talk about. Um, now, it may be resolved in a way that it's not fixed. For example, it's declared to be a duplicate of another defect report, right? Um, or it's postponed or just decided it's not going to be fixed. It's not worth, worth fixing. There's a type, and we'll talk about regression testing probably next time, maybe today, if we, if, um, if we uh, 
move fast enough um, or whether it's a, it's a regular bug. Basically, a regression would be something that worked before and is no longer working or a bug that came up again, it was there before and it's, it's re-emerged again. Okay, so to create a good report, you're gonna to wanna to do some structured exploration, you know, what's causing it, you're gonna make sure that it's reproduced reliably, if at all possible. Um, isolate what's needed for it, uh, generalize that, that case and find what versions, like why would you find what versions um, have, are associated with this problem? Why would that be useful to the dev to fix this? If you're a tester and you test it with old versions of the software, what does that help? Yeah, context. Uh, sometimes the failure might not be the code, or might be uh, the implementation process. Well, I think if you plug it, it's not going to move. Okay, good, good. So it, it could be something other than the code itself. I like that. And by comparing with previous versions, you might find, well, wait a minute. Um, uh, this is something which, you know, uh, actually goes goes way back, but it, it manifests as long as you have this plugin available, regardless of what version, for example. Okay, what's another reason you might you might want to know, like, what might it tell you if you found it in the last two versions, but not before that? Yeah, yes. Almost like wolf fencing as well, you get time, like, a Totally, totally. It's a, like, retrospective wolf fencing. It's like you're, you're being able to say, where might this bug be living based on, okay, if it didn't exist before this date and it did afterwards, maybe it's, maybe it was associated with code that was added, right, um, uh, between these two dates. And then you can start to look at the code that was added and it might give you a clue as to what code is needed for it to be reproduced, uh, et cetera. You're gonna want to summarize it, um, uh, condense it, you know, make it make it small and, and and importantly neutralize it. Why do I say neutralize? It sounds like an odd thing to say, but why would I want to neutralize a bug report? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we live software software engineering is conducted in, in the human theater uh, in the human sphere. It's a human activity. And there is an age-old tension between testers and developers. And it may sound exaggerated, but the truth is that it, there are long-standing tensions that come up when you write code that you are proud of and you feel you know, is an expression of your, of your professional skill and someone else's job is to find problems with your code. You know, there's, there's a certain amount of tension that can come up. And it's unfortunate. And at a certain level, uh, many, many teams are good at moving beyond it. But I will tell you that it's a very well-known phenomenon that testers and developers sometimes are at loggerheads with each other. I wish it weren't so. This sometimes comes out in other spheres besides testing, like peer review, where you know people's uh, deep, uh, people's artifacts, whether it's code or te or, or or test plans or or requirements documents, get uh, suggestions from others. People sometimes get defensive, and one of the best things you can do with bug reports is to make it clear that. You know, to make them less less likely to be taken personally. You know, um, less likely to be barred. You don't want to put a fine point on something. Um, you know, this code is totally broken. Um, uh, or you know, um, this code has um, made for quality quality problems. You want to be careful how you phrase this and. And so you, you want to put in a bit of care with, with your test reports um, to, to not, to not uh, unnecessarily cause uh, people to, to sort of fly off the handle or feel that their work is being underappreciated. Um, this is not a small matter in some cases, so just bear that in mind. 
Okay, a few suggestions on your environment. Um, these are very basic things, but plan a test environment. Have a test environment. Have a well-defined environment in which you're running your system, okay? Um, you might have several test environments that are well-defined. You know, you'll be testing it under Firefox and under, under uh, Chrome and under Safari or something like that. But, but have a well-defined test environment so that if it's reproduced in one, someone else can reproduce it. They don't have to go install Chrome and not know what version you have and can't get to your version. Have a certain continuity. And critically, you're going to want to reset the state of the system following the test. What do I mean by that? Reset state following the test. OK, so you run your test. Maybe it frogs the database. Or maybe it inserts things in a document. Yeah, uh, Sam. create tests from them, okay? And in fact, there's whole industries where this is a huge issue. I've worked with people in certain regulated industries, pharma, pharmacies, I mean, excuse me, pharmacological industries, so uh, big pharma, as it's called, the, the com big drug companies. They will have formal acceptance tests directly derived from requirements. And they actually will test the system through its requirements paces. Um, and it's a formal process that they have to go through to commission the system for many types of systems. Okay, now having a distinct test environment is important. Um, this has been a bane of many students over the years. Um, one issue is particularly big in Windows, um, which is admin access. A lot of Windows developers have traditionally run with admin privileges. Because of Windows, traditionally, it's been hard to do a lot of basic operations without having admin privileges. The problem is if you're running as admin on the system, why does that get in the way of testing? Suppose I'm running as admin. Why might that obscure certain bugs for me? What sort of bugs? If I'm running as admin and software works fine and I give it to you and you're not running as admin, could you imagine some problems that might come up? Yeah, for now. Have access to some exactly. Matthew? Yeah, it's permissions issues. 
You're admin. You can write willy-nilly to all sorts of stuff, right? You can read things. But if there's someone who's then handed the code base without admin privileges, that often won't run. And so you, you want to really restrict what you run with admin access. Needless to say, you don't want your system to perpetually run with admin access for security reasons. If someone broke into it, it would be bad news in a major way. Um, another thing is computational resources. I mean, look, the, the folks here in the room, many of them will, for development purposes, et cetera, have computational resources at their disposal that are well above what your average user will have. This could include processors, or disk space, or network speed, monitor resolution. And one of the challenges is if you go and you deliver a system for the average user, having developed it with lots of computational resources, it may really impair their experience um, because they're seeing it on a system it wasn't designed for. And so it's going to be a lot slower than you, you felt it was as developer. Um, I've run into this with smartphone development. Okay, so you develop it with nice big smartphones, lots of screen real estate, and then you give it to folks who need to run it on much smaller screens, and it doesn't work nearly as well. It doesn't it doesn't look nearly as acceptable. Um, uh, you're going to want the ability to reconfigure to have different configurations over time. Um, Probably to try your system, for example, with different browsers or different uh, particular environments. Um, and uh, this may involve different Docker images, for example, um, to run it under different, uh, different containers that have, have different amounts of resources, et cetera. Um, and I, I do want to note the central value of containerization within this, uh, within this context. You know, with containerization, um, there's a, a lot of things that are made simpler. To have an environment that is common to all the people running the software, a, a container will guarantee exactly this environment when running the system. And finally, when you restore the system at its end, when the container finishes running, by definition, that state is, is removed. It, it basically disappears. And you can run the container as if it's never run before from the start. Containers specify the resources on which they, they depend. And they start from precisely the same state every time. So when you finish it, there's no need for you to reset anything inside the container. Rather, the next time you run that container, it will be fresh. It will be the original state associated with that container. If you are operating outside of that, you're going you know, to want to make copies of data that can be destroyed or modified before tests. So you don't overwrite the things which may be necessary for reproducing it. Um, and you probably, if you're doing exploratory testing, it's advised to write down what you're doing um, you know, over time so that you, if you encounter a problem, you know roughly the set of steps that, that you led up to at that point. Okay? Um, so when you have problems reproducing, I, I've spent many an hour and sometimes days trying to reproduce bugs. Um, I think the worst number was a like it took me a couple, I was a professional software developer, it took me a couple days to reproduce. Reliable. And to zero. It was one of these Heisen bugs for C code. There was a loose point, I think, or, or, or um, problem with, uh, with buffer overflow or what have you. Um, so, some problems here. Uh, developer and test environment are different. The developer can't reproduce a bug that the tester found. Uh, containerization can help here. Race conditions. It's a race condition. We brought it up in this class before. Matthew. And that's guys to access the metal and get it a Y for Z. Yeah. Good. And there are two different concurrent processes trying to access that, for example. Um, which one gets there first? 
will yield, if A gets to it first, it will yield different results than if D gets to it. And, and basically, whether this error occurs depends on the vagaries of which of several concurrent processes reach a certain critical point um, in the code uh, first. Um, so that can lead to problems reproducing it. Um, uh, forgotten external details, things that you think are irrelevant. Time of day. Time since the machine was rebooted. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the version of some library that comes with Ubuntu or what have you. Um, external details you think are, are irrelevant to the situation. Um, uh, you did something unintended and forgot. You know, you, you did a screen, um, you, you, you went to class and you suspended it, you slept the system and thought that was irrelevant and uh, the error occurs after that, but it was related to that. Or you switch screens, right? You plugged in, you were running it on your laptop screen and then you plugged in your big monitor. And then it crashes not long afterwards and you don't realize that it's, it's related to that. The bug changes the state, or maybe there's a fra heat fragmentation or, uh, issue. It only occurs the first time that runs. Typically, that's because it changes the state. Maybe it's a cascading failure. What do I mean by cascading failure? Anyone? What do I mean by a cascading failure? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, so like A fails, and because A fails, because there was a network connection failure, maybe it leads to data being written to the device rather than being sent over the network, and maybe it runs out of, out of um, disk space or, or storage space. And so it was a cascading failure. The problem was the network went down, and that caused this buildup of space, but unless you reproduce this thing you might not have noticed that the network went down for a while and you might not be able to reproduce this problem. And, um, uh, again, it wasn't, it wasn't um, Time-dependent resource uh, dependence. Um, uh, hardware, ladies and gentlemen. Blaming hardware is the last refuge of the incompetent software engineer. It must be the hardware. The hardware is bad. Now, there are times where hardware has some issues or you're dealing with a buggy driver, but it's very rare in my experience that that's the guilty party. That's the, that's the problem. Um, so when I first started teaching this class, we had a colorful faculty member in our department who taught computer security. Uh, his, his name was Terry Roebuck. I don't know. Any of you might know him, but he, like myself, was a special constable uh, with the police. Uh, and he did it because he investigated computer security challenges. And, and, and he was called to investigate computer security crimes, um, crimes involving break-ins, hackers, uh, uh, malware, et cetera, spread deliberately um, by various agencies. Um, he was also a software developer, like me. And uh, as a consultant, he built software for a number of number of projects around Saskatoon. I think quite a number. And one of the projects he built was actually for a place that many of you know, on a scale. Folks, familiar on a scale? So um, you folks may be too young to remember it, but one scale has gone through a lot of changes over the years. And one of the changes was they used to have a, uh, a space that, um, I think it's now more of a cafeteria area, but um, they used to have a space that was like, um, uh, they had uh, displays of various uh, items from indigenous cultures. And one of them was a um, sort of a display on hunting techniques and technologies. Um, they had a, a wigwam there with, with buffalo skins over a frame. They had you know, various animals that were hunted and traps to, to catch the animals and um, uh, baskets for gathering berries or what have you. 
Um, I don't know if any of you remember it. It was quite a, kind of a, a darker room, but you could go into. And you could actually go in the wigwam and et cetera and the, with, the, uh, with the buffalo skins. Anyway, so he created, he was asked to build a system, a software system, to have a game where you, you engaged in a video game to engage in traditional indigenous activities in the form of hunting. So it was called Buffalo Hunt. Okay? And you would, you would go through and hunt buffalo in the game. And you know, they, could, they had a buffalo jump, or you could, you know, you could run them into a, a stockade area where they're surrounded by fences. And you, know, you could send people who had buffalo skins on and disguise chasing them and, and whooping and, and you know, scare them, etc. Anyway, so they, they had this game, and it was quite a good game, I have to say. I think I saw it there, and I, I, I think I played it bad. Anyway, um, so they built this game for one escape, and they launched it. They had a launch, and uh, that day went great. Um, so they're there, and, and um, it, uh, that first day, uh, quite a few people played it. I think they may have been lining up to play it. In any case, it, uh, it was a big success. So um, everyone was happy. One of the was happy. The developers were happy. And they went back and started working on other projects. And then they got a call the next day saying um, the, the system seems to have crashed. Um, you know, it's no longer working. And they said, well, what's going on? And it, uh, I, I think it froze up maybe that time. They said, oh, this is really weird. Maybe it's a hardware problem. <laughs> so they went in and, and reset it. It seemed, it seemed the computer was wedged. So they, they reset it and went home. And they got a call, I think it may have been that afternoon, saying um, the computer system crashed. So they went back and it. It, it, this time it like it had died. I don't remember all the details of this, but they called, got called a number of times. And each time they would go in, and they did start to suspect hardware problems. They may have even changed hardware, but it still kept on happening. And it was happening enough, like many times a week, that it was a big problem for them as software developers, especially because they couldn't do anything about it. All they could do was like reboot it and say, let's hope for the best this time. Right? Um, uh, a game about hunting buffalo, you don't want to just say, let's hope for the best, right? Um, so, so they were getting very embarrassed. And this went on over weeks and maybe into months. And it was, it was several times a day, often it would die. And they didn't, they didn't know what to do. Um, so they decided eventually you know, after trying different things technically, they decided, okay, what they're going to do is they're actually going to go there in person and they're going to see when this happens. So they went there and they <laughs> tried to hang out in this room, right? Terry's a really big guy and, and I don't know, maybe he hit, a, hit in the wigwam, I don't know. But he, they, they, they were hiding, they were sort of standing, trying to stand <laughs> innocuously in the room to see what was happening. And so they saw lots of people come in and they played the game and everything was fine and, and you know, things, things were good. Um, uh, but they were watching, watching like hunters. And, uh, you know, things, things went fine, but, but they noticed people were using it in different ways. Some people just touched it a little bit, used it for, long, uh, for, for almost no time. Some people used it for a while. And they couldn't make rhyme or reason, but they were just waiting for it to crash. And finally, they saw someone come in and who was really interested in the room and, and went into the wigwam and so on and, and really liked the, the buffalo fur and were stroking it and then came over to the computer to play and it crashed. And they said, aha. What, what were they thinking? Stat, stat. I think it was winter <laughs> by this point. So, so they went, they let, they rebooted it and let the people go through. And then they went and they rubbed the buffalo fur. And they went and they played the game and it crashed. And they said, okay, now we're, now we're in good shape. So they got an anti-static mat underneath the game console 
underneath the, the computer, they put an anti-static map, map, and the problem disappeared. And they were happy. And want to scale when it was happy. So, reproducibility. They couldn't reproduce it over weeks or months because of something else happened that they thought was irrelevant. They didn't think about it. It was just something that happened to be in, you know, in proximity to this and, and involved you know, people's behavior in an unexpected way interacting with the system. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, buffalo hunt. Um, and, and when it gets frustrating, remember, there's got to be something else going on that, that is explaining, you know, why it's not reproducing, okay? Buffalo hunt. Um, okay, uh, time is moving on, and uh, I want to, uh, I want to just uh, talk about a number of, of other subjects here. One is, um, in the course of a project, it's very useful to report on the number of defects in the system or system trouble in the system, okay? Um, and a, a particular important subcategory of these have to do with what are called active ones. These are ones that have been sanitized. And we'll talk about this notion in just a few minutes. But basically, these are ones that have been validated as not being duplicates, not being updated. These are, these are STIs which are, we have reason to believe are, are new significant STIs, okay? Um, when I say new, I mean they're not just a duplicate of another in the database. Um, other things to report on the percent of tests that you have that are complete or the number of test steps that are running. Um, other projects sometimes will track the age of the closure. Like, how long has this bug been circulating? How long is it from its creation to when it's fixed? Okay. Um, some teams additionally uh, track fault feedback ratio. Basically, for every bug fixed, how many new ones come up? But I certainly don't, don't require that here. Number of defects opened and number of defects closed per week is really useful. Okay. Um, so, Suppose we have successive weeks. We have bugs found and we have bugs fixed. Okay. New bugs found is blue. New bugs fixed or bugs fixed is the Magenta. What if there are the largest number of, of uh, bugs in the system? What is there the, the largest number here of bugs that are These are the number per week found, and these are the number of fixed. What is there going to be a max of the number in the system? Yeah. Okay, so, so you might think the first week is luck. I mean, there's lots being found here, and comparatively few being fixed. But will? Um, might when the number found and the number of fixed cross over. Good, because what's going on before? Here, for each successive week, you're finding more than you fix. And so the number is just going up, right? It's like you have a bathtub and you have water flowing in that's 200 liters per minute and water flowing out, that's a big bath, and 100 liters per minute. And, uh, and so the, the level of the bathtub is gonna be rising. If the water's coming in a lot faster than it's going out, it's true that at this time, there can be a fair bit of water in there, but if, if the inflow is better than the outflow, the level of that tub is going to be rising. And it's going to continue to rise in this week, right? Because we're finding more than we fix. Even in this week, even though the differential is less, even though there's less of a gap, we're finding more than we fix. The inflow is still greater than the outflow. It's going to be coming up. It can't drain as quickly as it's coming in. Same thing for this week, same thing for this week. So Will's bang on. It's actually right up to here. This is when there's a maximum number. In fact, these two weeks, there's no change here because you're finding you know, the same number as you fix. These weeks, you're fixing more than you find. So what's going to be going on all through this period? It's dropping. <coughs> it's dropping. The number of bugs that you're finding. Okay? 
Um, so just be aware, defects accumulate. They accumulate. New ones are found. Ones are fixed. But they're accumulating in the system. It's like that bathtub. It's, it's, it's growing. It's accumulating over time. And it may take quite a while for a defect found here to eventually be fixed. It's not like it goes in and comes out immediately. It, it has to, you know, over time, things are being fixed, new ones are being found, and it may be quite some time. So this one age at closure, it may actually take a while for it to be, to be closed. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, so there's a notion of directed triage, okay? And the triage team will be involved in this. So people on the triage team, you're going to want to pay attention to this. This is not mainstream triage. Mainstream triage is basically about fixing, figuring, uh, uh, figuring out which bugs should be fixed and which should be left, which we're going to leave, which we're going to fix for this release. Um, balancing the risks there. Directed triage involves one or more people, maybe it's the triage team, wading through the bug reports. You're going through these reports that are not yet sanitized, not yet prioritized, and trying to figure out what are their priorities, which of them are duplicates, which of them are outdated. And basically, it's an information gathering exercise. It's improving your understanding of the situation. It's like, how serious uh, a shape are we in? Like, how serious are these bugs? Are they a lot of minor things, or are they really serious things? That's what directed triage is about. It's going through and saying, where are we at when it comes to defects? Okay? And that's a very important part of, of uh, managing a project. Okay? Um, so uh, defect, uh, dealing with, uh, with defects requires you to reason about them at at uh, different stages of their life. And I'm, I'm tempted to go directly to this. Let's, let's cut to the chase. Defects, ladies and gentlemen, are not just some undifferentiated whole. There's defects and there's defects. There, there are different quality levels of, of, of defects, or different types of defects, different groupings. And I've divided them in, here into boxes and put these arrows between, these flows between, to indicate that some bugs say go from undiagnosed bugs to bug reports. Okay. So one of the most important groups of bugs to think about, or stocks of bugs that you're talking about, it, is undiagnosed bugs. Those are bugs that we don't know about. Now in this class, I will be teaching you methods to estimate the size of that stock. You can't see it, but you can reason about how big it is at least at a statistical level. But I'd like to talk now about the, the processes that bring, bring defects through the system to, to find a resolution, okay? So a bug starts undiagnosed, almost always. Almost by definition, it starts not being known. Right? We introduce it, and we don't know it's there. Through a process of testing, either formal or informal, it's brought into a, uh, a bug report. Now the key thing here, and I want everyone to pay attention to this, this is like prime exam material. Really sexual exam material. These bug reports include a lot of craft. They include a lot of things that are not, not worth you worrying a lot about. Why? Because they're duplicates of others. Someone already reported this defect. Or they're outdated, like the person is using an outdated system version. Or they're based on incorrect understanding, like they're using an, 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 a too old version of iOS. It's only supposed to be iOS you know, 8 and above, and here they are using it on, on 7. Or they have some misunderstanding of the features of the system. They think it's supposed to do this, X, and it actually does Y. Very important. Consideration. By the way, you might want to know about that so you can help educate people, right? <coughs> maybe improve the documentation or the help system or make it a clearer menu or whatever. But the point is, it's not a defect in the code to be fixed or the design to be fixed. 
It may clue you into something that has to be fixed in the documentation or what have you. Uh, no understanding. But in any case, this bug reports, these bug reports submitted probably have lots of stuff. You don't really, doesn't have a lot of gravity to it. It's not really, not every one of them is worth worrying about. And there's a process called sanitization by which these bug reports are, are sorted through and we identify ones that are what are called active defects or active bugs, okay? Active defects is a fairly common term. Active defects are ones that have been checked. They're not duplicates, they're not outdated, they're reasonable things. Yes, they're a, a use case it should address, but it's not, it's not working properly. So these are the ones that have extra weight, right? Because they're, they're real. And they're distinct. And that whole directed triage, a lot of it consists of going from like bug reports and sorting out, okay, how many real new defects do we have? And how many of them are important? So the sanitization brings you to active bugs, where you know it's not corrupt. Active bugs, the important bugs is the triage process. Okay? That's the process of saying, look, are we going to fix this thing? Or is this something we're going to live with? You know, it's such a minor thing, so risky, um, that, that we're not going to push it. You are empowered to do that in this class. You're empowered to say, look, it's too risky to fix this, or this, is, this would be really, really messy, and we'll just put in place a warning in our documentation. We'll put in place a workaround. That's the whole triage thing, you know, sorting through which of these active bugs actually gets promoted to be important enough to fix. Okay. Now, once it's fixed, it's assigned to developers. You'll assign it to a dev. Remember that thing some time ago when we saw that defect report? It says assigned to. Remember that? So, um, at the cost of giving you whiplash, um, it's, uh, it was right back person assigned to. This is the dev it's assigned to. Okay, and and that developer will then go work on it. And they will report it as fixed. Okay? Well, they may say, uh, you know, it's not fixed. <coughs> but in order for it to be resolved, the reporter of the quality assurance team, the person who reported this defect way back here, or the quality assurance team needs to demonstrate, yes, it's actually fixed. Why? Why not just have this be resolved? Why not, why not have it be totally resolved once the developer has said it's resolved? Yeah, Brandon. Yeah. Is it Brandon? Me? <laughs> oh, man. Um, my hash on who is the dad. Oh. to do or how it has to treat a certain case. And so they may make the same mistake again, or they may be defensive about it, and, and they just want to say, look, this is fixed. It was never broken in the first place. And, and you don't want to get that, get into that, um, that sort of fight. W was there another hand up? OK. So, so Mason, uh, Mason and Will have addressed this. Yeah, it's a, it's a cross check. It's a check particularly against the developer making the same mistakes twice 
or not understanding the bug report, right? Because the person who reported it or the QA team often knows what was really meant by this bug report. And the, the dev might not really have a good understanding of that. Even if they're not the first person who wrote, the person who wrote it, they might not have understood the bug report well. And so the person who reports it often will have a keener sense of what's meant. I can't tell you the number of times in my professional life, ladies and gentlemen, where I've reported a problem and the person tells me it's fixed and I go and I try it and it's obviously not fixed. And it's not that the person is lying or the person is devious or the person is, you know, is, 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 is fundamentally has some, you know, profound problem. It's, there's a communication gap. They don't under, really understand what I mean. And there's a very good reason um, that therefore underlies this requiring the person to report it or the quality assurance team to make sure it's resolved. That will make sure, you know, this thing is, is, is fixed. So this process is key, and I do expect you to know these words sanitized and, and the triage of where these come in and active bugs compared to all bug reports and these important bugs. Um, I will finally know that from a standpoint of a dynamic system, such as I teach about in 394, um, these fixes, these so-called fixes here, often generate new bugs. And so you often get an undue number of new bugs introduced as things work their way down here are supposedly fixed, but actually introduce bugs. And, and you know, quite often someone thinks it's fixed, but it's actually just back here in the important bugs um, situation. So one of the biggest challenges we have as developers is we don't know the size of this undead undiagnosed bug stock and, and often new things are coming into it as a result of fixing others. Um, it makes, makes it, it hard to run. Okay, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about test reports. So I've, I've shown you test matrices um, before and you know another type of tabular form. So test matrices, what are those included? Remember the test matrices? Yeah. yeah. So, list of your requirements, Good. your features, and yeah. then taking objectives against your test. Excellent, excellent. And it doesn't have to be all of those. What you listed was um, impressively thorough. Sometimes you only find it with features, for example, at a given time, or only with requirements. It's awesome if you can do something more than that because often you will want to know which of my tests test which are my requirements and on the flip side which of my tests test which are my features. But you know, uh, I value I value uh, test test matrices that don't have all of this stuff. Um, but and then as tests, it indicates which test tests which things, uh, tests which of these features or which of these requirements, etc. Here, we're going to have a test, uh, a test report that's different. It looks like a table as well. And often it will have features on this left side. And so it's a little bit like a, a test matrix in that regard. But here you're reporting like which tests have been run, which, how many of them were successfully run versus those that were run unsuccessfully. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's often a fraction given a what fraction of the tests that have been run are now successfully run? Let me ask this. Is it equally good to not run a test and to run a test unsuccessfully? Are those kind of equal? Is all we care about the number of successful tests? Or does running a test unsuccessfully, is that different than never running it at all? Yes, yeah, Totally. Like, if you run this test and it doesn't work, that tells you something very important. Something is probably broken in here that I have to fix. If 
you don't, if you've never run it at all, then you're a little bit in the dark. Do we have quality problems or not? Right. Um, if you've run it successfully, well, that's the best situation, right? If there's a test and it's run successfully. I want to highlight this. So, um, anyone recognize these names? Voyager, Magellan, Galileo. Other than scientists, these are what? Beyond, beyond being scientists, these are, uh, they are space, spacecraft. So uh, they have some similarity to shuttles in the sense that they blast it off. But they go further than the shuttle. Where do these go? The deep space probes. The deep, deep space probes. Um, uh, Voyager is outside the solar system now. Um, Galileo shocked them. Galileo went to uh, some of the planets and, and maybe headed uh, um, headed to the further reaches of the, of the, the solar system in, in Magellan. These are basically NASA probes, uh, deep space probes, um, for planetary exploration and then in Voyager case for interstellar, Voyager 1, Voyager 2. Anyway, um, uh, this is a graph of their number of defects found um, over time, cumulatively, for each of these probes based on weeks of testing. So I want to draw attention to a couple of things. One thing is that this is many weeks. If you reason about you know, the fact that uh, a year is just over 50 weeks, right? That's about from yay long. And you've got many, many years, right, here. Um, secondly, it only goes up. And that's, these are cumulative counts, right, of number of defects. Uh, per thousand lines of code of the system. So it goes up over time. The longer you test it, the more defects can live to that you have found to date. Another thing is that it tends to go up in bursty ways. Do you see this? It goes up and then boom. And then boom, boom, boom. It found a whole bunch of defects, evidently, in these sort of periods. Why would that be? Why would it be find a bunch together? Yeah, well, either new tests are introduced or new chunks of code are added. Okay, I like that. New chunks of code may be added. That's actually really new. Yeah. Um, new tests, and I would argue new types of tests sometimes. Like sometimes you find a defect that's representative of a whole class of things. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, we never thought of that before. Yeah, there could be a defect of this race type of race condition or this sort of loose pointer problem or this sort of buffer overflow or, or what have you. Um, this sort of user, user um, you know, failure to handle these user cases. And then you, you end up learning from that and you find a bunch more in quick succession. Okay. These are per thousand lines of code. Okay. Um, uh, eight defects over here for Galileo, um, creeping up towards 10 per thousand lines of code. So about one per hundred lines of code. Defects are out there. And sometimes it takes a long time to find them. And it is the case that generally speaking, you find more early and then it becomes harder to find them later. Why is that? Why is it easier to find things early and then harder later? Yeah, is it? Less code to go through. Okay, less code to go through. You've been through a fair bit of the code? Yeah, okay. Okay, um, to, a, to a degree, um, you've, been, you've been through it. Um, anyone else want to take a crack at that? Sam, yeah. Uh, you found the easier ones, the ones that are really obvious. Exactly. Yeah, we tend to, it's not like um, a new uh, mathematical statistician who specialized for a lot of its careers in uh, the statistics of the oil industry. Um, and one of the, the features that he found is like the big oil fields were found very early. And, you know, fairly early. And then they have to find, you know, um, 
be increasingly clever to find similar levels of, of, of oil deposits as the decades went on historically. And, and so they were tapping into you know, things that were more and more sophisticated in terms of their ability to drill underground and tap, um, tap reservoirs that were smaller or harder to reach or you know, talked with brine or whatever. So the point is a lot of the times we find the easy ones first, and then it becomes harder to find successive ones. Um, and this is true for your systems too. The ones that just are right in front of your face, you're gonna find early. The ones that are, that are more subtle, it's gonna take efforts to find the ones that require two conditions to, to appear. Um, okay, um, good. Um, Right. Um, so, you know, there's this back and forth between the devs and the and the testers here. You know, finding problems, uh, passing them on as bug reports. The devs try to fix them. Um, there's test releases made with the uh, with those fixes in there. The testers try to assess did that did that uh, fix uh, fix work. Okay. Um, this is from critical testing processes. And one of the questions that comes up at a very practical level is, how many test releases do you push out? So to what degree are you pushing out one release that people test and bang on and you go and fix those, those problems, um, but you don't have another test release before the deliverable? Or to what degree are you releasing things on an ongoing basis? If you release things on an ongoing basis, what, what would be an advantage of that? Suppose we said, I'll just release once, you folks test it, I'll fix the things as the dev, and, uh, and then you know, we'll push out the final release to the stakeholders. What's, what's the risk of that? What's the risk of that? Yeah, well. Fixing bugs, you may introduce. Yeah, you fix so-called fixed bugs, you may introduce new bugs. And you, if you haven't pushed them over to the testers, who's doing the thorough testing? Maybe you run a set of unit tests on it, but how about the regression test, the test that tests for older bugs, or how about the manual testing? It's gonna be an issue if, if you have bugs in there and you don't have the manual testing going on or the automated tests or the regression tests of the, that the testers might run. So you're at risk if you only push one test release. Sam, did you want to say something in addition? Yeah, it's just more of the test. If you need uh, pushes, so like the test team is testing a lot newer stuff, whereas if you do it small chunks, you can do smaller new portions. That's right. You can you do this focus on smaller bits that have changed, for example. So these test releases, <coughs> it's tempting to make them very frequent. The problem with making them very frequent, well, what's the downside of making you know, daily test releases. Is there one? Well, there's a little bit of churn, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. You might only find the surface level, you only have time to find the surface yeah. level bugs. Yeah, exactly. If you don't have time to really drill down into it, because now you've got a new one to test, but now you've got a new one. You, you have to be really intelligent about how you test it, and who knows if you've got a new test release, maybe the login is broken, or maybe the side level thing is. So you've, you've got a lot of, things to keep up with. And it really puts a prime on quick testing, like automated tests, run a whole swack of you know, automated, uh, automated um, regression tests you know, once, you, uh, uh, once you get that new system up there. So this test release issue is gonna be, it's a very practical one. And if you don't have more than one test release, what you hand in may be problematic because it hasn't been tested. If you do too many, it may just get a bit overwhelming to get the latest version, and, and there's uh, a fair bit of overhead with that, and it may be hard to test it thoroughly, and that may inhibit turning something in a product uh, quality. So you have to be careful with the two or so weeks you have bef between your deliverables. Um, okay, those are some comments on, on aspects of testing. We're gonna continue on this more next time with, um, with some, additional, uh, some additional comments on critical testing needs and, uh, 
and principles um, uh, that will help you navigate, help you navigate testing. But it's uh, just prior to four, it's 3.52, and it is showtime. Um, so uh, I will uh, step down. Um,